Hey there, everyone. Eric Hurst here with Training Cafe. It's Friday, noon Eastern. It's that time again where we commune with coffee. Let's sip together. Hmm. Everything's better with coffee. Training, climbing, talking about training for climbing. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about how you wind down a training cycle and head into a road trip or a long weekend of climbing and be totally fresh, full power, ready to send. Because, you know, there's nothing more disappointing, and I've experienced this many times, where you train hard, you arrive at the crag, and your peak finger force isn't there. Your endurance isn't there for some reason or another. Now, it can be perhaps there's a, you know, a little bit of an illness you're not aware of. Uh, perhaps you had some bad sleep or a long drive or travel or something that uh, has affected your system. But more likely, it's a result of a training cycle that wasn't ended or properly tapered at the end of the training cycle. And so that's kind of what I want to spend a, a few minutes here. I'm going to go to the whiteboard and just try to give you a quick overview of how to uh, properly taper your training and uh, and then uh, maybe in about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll get to some of your questions and I see some questions flowing in right now. So um, I guess as a preface to this, um, how long you've been, how long of a training block you've been involved in will determine whether you really need to taper or not. If you're actively climbing outdoors, say maybe training indoors during the week and climbing outdoors on the weekend, well then there's not much to taper uh, other than to go easy on Thursday, rest completely on Friday, and hopefully you'll get a good Saturday, Sunday weekend of bouldering or sport climbing or track climbing, whatever you're heading out to do. Uh, and so in that context kind of of a on season or during the season, um, there's not a quote taper. It's just, you know, getting two days of rest before your weekend climbing. Uh, again, uh, if you're a weekend warrior, typically um, you would rest on Monday, you know, the day after you were at the crags, really working hard two days, Saturday, Sunday, presumably. So rest Monday, active rest. You could do stretching. You could do a little bit of running or light antagonist training. But then Tuesday, you probably want to do strength and power. So if you're going to do any hangboard work or campus work, I would do it on Tuesday because that is what takes the longest for your nervous system and connective tissues to recover from. So you would do that on Tuesday. Wednesday, you could do more a power endurance like four by fours or tension boarding where you're using limited rests and getting pumped. Um, or if you're going to do some rock climbing, Wednesday would be the day to do some uh, rock climbing for volume. Then Thursday, if you're going to do anything climbing specific, I would keep it um, low volume. I would do a warm up, just do a couple of uh, boulders, uh, maybe a couple of things on the campus board. It's got to, you have to really be disciplined not to fall into the trap of Thursday turning into a hard workout day. Uh, that is one thing that will leave you flat on Saturday. Uh, Thursday has to be, I guess that's your taper, you know, where you start to dramatically cut volume, you maybe do a, a tiny bit of some uh, high intensity work just to get turned on, but uh, very short workout, mostly warm up, mobility work, stretching, and just a little bit of uh, a bouldering or a brief bit of high intensity climbing. Friday, total rest, you're traveling, Saturday, you're climbing, Sunday, you're climbing. So that, that's kind of the weekend warrior approach. Now, if you're heading, uh, training a block, for a trip or to begin a season or to head into competition where you're uh, in a lengthy training period of 10 weeks or more, that's kind of what we're getting on, uh, getting into here, um, how to properly taper that. Um, and that's probably the mode that you've been in and I've been in, uh, you know, coming out of winter and then the COVID shutdown, you know, I'm kind of like an 
a six month training block. I don't think I've ever had a training block like this. And to be honest, I'm really tired of training as much as I love it. Um, I'm ready to head outdoors. And sure enough, um, this is our last weekend at home because we're going to be uh, beginning our drive out west uh, to some re remote climbing in the Rockies uh, for the next few weeks. Um, and so this taper is what I've been doing this week, you know, kind of winding down this intense period of training and uh, getting ready to hopefully climb pretty well. Though, as I discussed in a previous uh, episode, you know, a couple uh, training cafes ago, you know, I haven't been outdoor climbing for a long time and you probably haven't either or very little. Uh, and so you have to expect there's going to be a week or two or perhaps more to just get used to moving over stone. You know, climbing on plastic and pulling on a campus board or hangboard isn't the same. It's good for physical training, but you need to get out and get your technique and your, your mind game together. And that will take some time. But if you've been climbing a number of years, as I have been, it will come back quick. It's kind of like riding a bike. Um, but again, I'm not going to be sending my hardest ever red point uh, day one that I'm back on the rock, I don't think. Okay, so let's shift uh, over here. I'm going to see if I can get the whiteboard aligned so that you can uh, properly see it here. And what I have here um, on this crude graph, intensity increasing, volume increasing, volume in green, intensity in black. And then across the bottom here is time. So this is uh, the first day of your trip or the beginning of your trip over on this side. One week out, two weeks out. Here's kind of a little bit of a break where the scale changes. We go to four weeks to eight weeks to 10 weeks plus. So this model for adjusting intensity and volume would apply to a training cycle of 10 or more weeks. And um, if you're a really experienced trainer and you, you've been through this process many times of you know, training for a few months, going on a trip, training for a month or two, going on a trip, um, you get really good at, at knowing how to, to make this work for your body, for your genetics, for your age and you know the training you do. Uh, pro climbers are experts at this. Okay, I think we're back here. Looks like my Wi-Fi might have uh, dropped out for an instant. Hopefully you guys, um, can someone just give me a thumbs up that the stream is coming through here uh, once again. Um, and we shall forge ahead, hopefully. Um, not sure where this would have dropped off exactly where I was at. But um, let me just uh, get back to the idea that this chart will depict how to adjust intensity and volume in the weeks leading up to your trip, which is here, one week out, two weeks out, four weeks out, eight weeks out, 10 plus weeks out on this side of the chart. So um, uh, let's go through this, you know, kind of the, the ultimate thing you see here, the final week or week and a half, you see volume and intensity both dropping off, but not uh, on the same time scale. But before we get to that, let's come back to this side of the chart. Let's say you're 10 or 12 weeks uh, out from a trip. Uh, at that point, you may be doing a lot of high volume climbing, rope climbing in the gym, um, threshold training if you have a tread wall or if you have a bouldering wall that you can do laps on and do kind of those, you know, two minute on, two minute off burns or four minutes on, uh, eight minutes off repeaters. Those types of things really work the uh, oxidative energy system, and you'll get some lactic work in there as well. So your volume's very high, your intensity is moderately high. Um, after a, a, a phase of that, you would get into a period of very high intensity training, but the volume drops down. That would be your strength power block, which might only be three weeks. Um, that, that's where you would do your max weighted hangs. Uh, some campus training. You could put cu couple them together if you're an advanced trainer to do uh, complex training. Um, volume has to be down. Again, you're not doing the shotgun approach. You're not doing aerobic training, lactic training, and max strength and power training all at the same time. 
We want to be more focused and more targeted with our energy system training. So the high intensity has to be uh, coupled with a reduction in volume. That way you will get ideal adaptations. And then there's this period about uh, two or three weeks out from your trip where both intensity and volume are quite high. And that is your power endurance work, your anaerobic alactic work. Uh, that is where you would be doing a lot of um, very pumpy, high intensity uh, protocols. Um, uh, bouldering four by fours would be the classic if you're on a bouldering wall. Um, or a tread wall, we do a lot of uh, one minute on all out, one minute all out climbing, four minutes of rest, one minute all out climbing. And you could do that on a, a bouldering wall or an indoor climbing wall as well. But it's all about, um, you know, getting power as high as you can and sustaining it for 30 to 60 to maybe even 90 seconds. That's where that anaerobic reserve is being tapped. And of course, you get very acidy and very pumped. Now, that training can't go on forever. Two to three weeks is about the ideal duration, I believe, and that's what most professionals uh, in a variety of sports have determined. If you do that very pumpy lactic training much longer or, you know, week in and week out for months, as some climbers mistakenly do, uh, because they think that's what they need more of, is that real pumpy training. Um, that leads to uh, an overtraining syndrome and uh, can actually run you down um, to the point that it takes weeks to get back to peak form. Um, and so this period, two or three weeks out from your trip, where you're doing quite high volume and quite high intensity, must be, you know, relatively brief. Might only be six sessions over two weeks. And then the taper begins. So on this chart, the taper begins actually right here, about a week and a half out. And notice the first thing that tapers is volume. Intensity stays high, even into the final week. And so this is what I have been doing here myself to prepare for my trip I'm leaving for here soon, is cutting back in the volume my last four or five days of training uh, compared to what I have or was previously doing, there's a reduction in volume each time. And I record that by minutes of climbing. I do the same warm up every time, but uh, my kind of main training block where I'm working hard, the number of minutes I'm on the wall or on the hangboard if I'm doing repeaters, um, but I do most of my training on a, on a tread wall in this phase. I, I'm reducing the number of minutes, number of uh, intervals that I'm doing. Intensity stays high. And in fact, right down to like about three or four days before the trip, I will dabble on the campus board. Very low dose. I think I did a couple of days ago, just um, I did one, four, six, and I think I did maybe three on each side. So not a, a very intense campus board training, but enough to get the nervous system firing, enough to get the connective tissues to um, respond in a way that actually um, enhances cross-linking um, and, and stiffens the system and allows you to be more forceful, more powerful. Um, and by the way, along with this... Um, period here where you're doing, you know, a brief amount of power work. I'm not doing any long hangboard work. Um, I will do a few warm-up hangs and a few weighted hangs, but they're only five to seven seconds in duration. I'm not doing any hangs of 10 or 15 or 20 seconds. I'm not doing a lot of repeater work or anything like that. Um, I'm not doing any extensive isometric training because that kind of defeats the purpose of what we're after here. When you're doing uh, longer duration isometric hangs, whether it's on a hangboard or lock-off training, um, that's good for training tendon um, 
regeneration, remodeling, uh, and compliance, but not good for stiffness. Um, those isometric hangs, those weighted hangs, if you're doing 10 or 15 second hangs, or you're doing a lot of isometric work, your collagen is stimulated to uh, remodel. It, you, the, the tenocytes get a good signal from that, but the collagen fibrils during the isometric hangs uh, slide and break the cross links. If you think of cross bracing uh, in, in the trusses of your house, you have the main framing and then the cross bracing. Well, your collagen fibrils have cross breaking. It's called their enzymatic cross links. Um, and they break when you do a lot of isometric hangs. Um, and that uh, is good for tendon health. It um, makes the tendons more compliant. So if you have achy tendons, if you have a tendinopathy of some type, your practitioner, your PT, your doctor, your coach, hopefully is having you do isometric work, longer duration isometric holds that does uh, get the tendons to adapt in a favorable way to get you through the injury. But if you are healthy, if you have healthy tendons, you don't want to be doing a lot of that density work. You want to be doing the opposite of that. You want to be doing campus training, plyometric work, power pull-ups, powerful bouldering. Because when the tendons are, are loaded quickly and briefly, you don't break the cross links. You don't break the cross breaking, uh, the cross braces, as I called it. And so you are actually stimulating the tendons. They will make some cross links, but not break very many. And so you have a net gain in cross links and you get a stiffer system. And these adaptations in terms of the cross linking happens quickly. About two weeks is all you need. You can get a tendon more stiff or more compliant in just about two weeks of this type of training. Again, the density training, the high intensity, longer duration isometrics break the cross links, make them more compliant. And that's good for health. But for performance, you don't want that. You want a stiffer tendon. As long as you don't have achy tendons or injured tendons, then you want to make them more compliant. So it all comes down to, are you a healthy climber or are you an injured climber? And if you're a healthy climber heading into a trip, you want to be more, you want, sti you want a stiffer system, like tightening the suspension of a sports car. Um, and so you do that by doing some of that brief, powerful work you want to keep that intensity up, but you really reduce the volume. And again, you don't do any of those longer duration isometric hangs. Uh, and then as you get down to your last like two or three days, you're just basically doing a warm up, some stretching, maybe some very light climbing just to move over the wall, but you have to be disciplined to not let it get carried away um, because you can't cram. One of my favorite sayings is you can't cram when it comes to training. You know, it's not like when you're in high school, you could cram the night before for the exam. You try to cram your training here at the end of a training cycle, you arrive on the trip tired and weak and flat. Um, and if that's ever happened to you, you that's, you know why, you know, uh, you tried to cram. And I've been there, you know, I've been there those last days thinking, oh man, I need to pound myself one more day because I really want to send this route. Um, and actually what I'm doing is taking actions that are going to, you know, probably prevent me from sending the route. So you get down to that last week and a half or a week, be disciplined, be smart, hear my voice in your head saying, don't cram, taper. That's kind of the bottom line there. Okay, so time to head on to some of your questions. Um, I see some folks have typed some in and let me just roll up here to the beginning and see what we got here. Okay. Um, Brandon, how many days does it take for endurance to start going away? Not exactly sure what you mean by that. Do you mean like a layoff from climbing? Um, you know, uh, what really leaves you the fastest when you take time off from training is, um, is your strength. Uh, I don't think you lose much in the first week or two but um, your, your strength drops off, your endurance drops off more slowly over the course of a month, let's say. Hey, something else, by the way, when you go on a road trip, okay, assuming you do the taper right and you get on the trip and you're at full power and full endurance your first week or two, 
um, if you're maybe climbing two days on, one day off, two days on, two days off, or something like that, um, you can sustain that for a couple of weeks. But then, you know, fatigue starts to set in if you're on a longer trip. And also, if you're not training, if you're not doing your, you know, if you're on, on the road, you're not doing campus training, you're not doing any types of hangboard work, you're um, climbing a lot, you tend to maintain endurance on a road trip, maybe even gain endurance on a road trip but you lose your high-end strength and power. So by week three and week four of a road trip, usually your high-end power is being lost. That's why a lot of the pro climbers will only go, I know, you know, um, the Germans who are really smart climbers, going back to Wolfgang Gulick and, you know, today Alex Megos, you know, uh, when they come to the United States, it's often a four-week trip um, because after four weeks, they're, they're losing their power. Or I guess if they go anywhere, you know, a four to six week trip, and then it's back to Germany to train. Um, and so if you're on a never ending road trip for months, or if you have a year off that you're just climbing, that's a tough one. You, your endurance will get up really high and your climbing technique and your mental game will be great because you're climbing a lot, but the high end strength and power is going to be is going to be lost. Um, it's it's never as good as it is coming out of a training cycle. And so that's where, you know, you have to kind of do your long-term scheduling. And um, Or if you're on a never-ending road trip, find a way, stop at a gym once every two weeks and, and put in a session on the hangboard and the campus board uh, to get uh, that high end back. Um, And speaking of the German guys, <laughs> um, here's a question. Uh, Seba asks about the Gimme Craft book, says if you really want to enhance your flexibility, you should do uh, some stretching as a separate workout. Yeah, you know, um, flexibility is somewhat genetically determined. Uh, not everybody's going to be able to do splits, even if they train long and hard. Um, and yes, as a rule of thumb, you know, before your workout, you want to do some dynamic stretching, not do anything extensive. Um, if you, you know, and that gets you prepared to perform. Uh, if you feel that you have some room to make gains in flexibility, let's say hip flexibility. Um, yeah, it's better to do that, uh, at the end of the day. Um, maybe, you know, your workouts over, you go home, you eat dinner, and then you do, um, as he mentions here, kind of a separate little workout, 20 minutes, let's say of stretching in the evening or before bed, you know, put on the TV and uh, do some stretching. That's kind of how I do it. Now, I don't, I, I just don't gain much flexibility. I'm uh, genetically uh, not so compliant. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do enough in the evening to try to maintain what I have in terms of hamstring and hip flexibility. And I think it is better to do, uh, if you're going to try to make gains, you have to do it daily, by the way. You can't just stretch one or two days a week and get anywhere. It doesn't work. Um, if you want to make gains, you got to put in probably 20 minutes, seven days a week. Hey, Griffin says, hi. Um, okay, let's see this. This might be uh, interesting. Um, now that I can climb outside, how can I combine climbing days with hangboard training during the week? Yeah, well, I kind of alluded to that earlier. If you're, uh, especially if you're a weekend warrior, I would do your hangboard training uh, or campus training on Tuesdays and then do your power endurance or your more endurance oriented uh, workout on Wednesday and then taper Thursday and rest Friday. Um, other than that, if you're climbing regularly throughout the week, um, I don't know that I would do much supplemental training on top of that. You, you know, if you're climbing outside, let's say every other day throughout the week, you kind of want your rest day to be a rest day. And when you end a climbing day, you want to get recovery started. So when you're, you know, if you climb on a Monday um, and you're going to rest Tuesday and climb again Wednesday, when you're done climbing on, on Wednesday, uh, when you're done climbing on Monday, it's kind of like you want to wrap it up and start the recovery process, you know, protein shake, good meal, good night's sleep. So to come home and then do training Monday night, let's say, on a hangboard, digs yourself a deeper hole and it um, delays the, the, the beginning of that recovery cycle so to get you back to where you want to be on Wednesday. Now, if you know that you have a two or three day off break from outdoor climbing, then maybe at the end of your climbing day, you could do a little bit of hangboard work, um, perhaps a tiny bit of campus work. I wouldn't do a lot, but maybe you do a little bit in that situation 
knowing that you have two or three days off to recover before your next climbing day. Neil says, climbing opening today in Scotland, but in a limited way. Well, it's good to hear. Um, I know uh, out west, the climbing gyms are now open in Utah. Not every state are they open, but things are opening up quickly. Even here in my state, um, a lot of the counties are have switched over today to green, um, which is kind of not back to normal, but a lot closer to normal than where we've been. And um, so... Uh, that's good news. There's a lot of progress. And I see a lot of people on uh, Instagram out climbing. And it seems like climbers, as best as I can tell, are mostly being responsible and trying to not be in groups and to, you know, uh, if you're in a populated area, wear a mask uh, and carpool with just your main partner or family members and doing all the proper things we should be doing. And I'm going to try to follow all those rules myself as best as I can, though. If I'm in uh, the uh, big horns of Wyoming, there's not too many people around. There's more um, uh, elk than there are people. So that's a good thing. Um, and uh, okay, let's take a look here. Andrew, currently seven weeks post partial tear of the, I assume he means profundus tendon. And I'm wondering how to best supplement recovery. Yeah, I, I'm cautious to comment on that. Um, you know, uh, sounds like you've been seeing a physician and that's great. Uh, if he's talking about the flexor digitorum profundus, that's the flexor tendon in your, it's the deep flexor tendon in your forearm that flexes the, the DIP joint. Um, and so while the uh, finger pulleys are more commonly ten, uh, injured, you can get tendon strains. Uh, he has partial tear. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, an injury like that is one I would not try to come back from too fast, you know, rushing back from any of these finger or forearm or elbow climbing injuries uh, can, you know, make it a chronic injury. So I would ease back into that, follow the, uh, the PT protocol, doing, uh, you want to do some loading as the healing progresses, a limited amount of loading, loading but it should not be painful. Um, and you can use a product like PhysiVantage Supercharged Collagen pre-workout to provide the amino acids into your system. There's collagen specific amino acids in a high dose into your system before your rehab. And that would help you along in the process. Um, which pull up bar do I use? You know, I couldn't tell you. I bought it years ago. It's just a standard like one and a quarter inch pull up bar um, that when we train, we vary the grip diameter and we use weights at times. We do a variety of exercises, though uh, all total, we probably spend more time hanging on our various hangboards. Richard, as a weekend warrior, uh, is it sensible to do 30 second density on Tuesday, seven second max hangs on Wednesday, then three second contact strength Thursday? Um, I, I, I'm not. I'm not so sure. Um, if you are a healthy climber, I don't know that the density hangs are something you want to be doing on season. Um, again, because they break cross links um, and uh, make the system, the tendons, the connective tissues more compliant. Um, it's like taking a stiff rubber band and stretching it out a bunch of times uh, so that it's uh, just more stretchy. You know. Um, that's what the density hangs do to your tendons, makes them more compliant, more stretchy. Um, now, would one session do that? I'm not sure. You know, in a rehab setting, you would do that, that type of heavy isometric work, you know, three, four days a week. One day a week, maybe uh, it would break a few cross links, but not as many. But so I'm kind of on the fence there. Um, uh, I, I also don't know that you should be doing significant loading three days in a row. Um, you know, uh, kind of defaulting back to what I mentioned earlier, if you're a weekend warrior, strength and power on uh, Tuesday, and then uh, anaerobic endurance on Wednesday, and then uh, kind of a, a light tapering workout Thursday. Um, and uh, not, you know, going into a base training mode, or rehab training mode, 
if it's not necessary, if it's your climbing season. Okay, six months of chronic lateral epicondylitis. That's the outside here, the bony part of your forearm. Not very intense. He can mostly climb on it, but it doesn't go away completely. Um, yeah, you know, uh, that is a chronic injury for some folks. And uh, if you're someone that crimps a lot and has a tendency to kind of chicken wing or bat wing, um, that is something we see a lot in people who get that condition. Uh, you, if you can get yourself to do more open hand uh, gripping, um, and when you find yourself getting fatigued in a workout or a climbing day and doing a lot of that chicken winging, maybe just end the day instead of continuing to climb and doing a lot of that. Um, and if any of those things you're thinking, yeah, I do that. Well, then that might be a reason why the condition is lingering. Um, and of course, rehab can help. And this is a perfect application of what we were just talking about. If you do um, a reverse wrist curl, heavy dumbbell in your hand, um, arm supported on a bench or on your leg or some other um, object, and then that 20 or 25 pound dumbbell you hold, uh, for 30 to 45 seconds and just slowly let the, um, the muscle lengthen. And of course, that provides a nice sustained loading of the tendons in your elbows, exactly what we were talking about. Like density hangs, the collagen fibrils slide and that breaks cross links and actually makes the tendon more compliant and more healthy. And that long isometric or eccentric gives a signal to the tenocytes. Those are the fibroblasts, the active, uh, you know, metabolic, the active cells in the, in the collagen that extrude and assemble new collagen fibrils and help remodel. So you're giving a good signal to the tenocytes and you're breaking crosslinks and making it more compliant. And that's why those isometrics, those slow eccentrics, those density hangs are so good if you have an injury or a connective tissue problem. Um, and so for you, um, I would recommend doing that type of thing three days per week. Okay. Okay, let's see what we got here. During a rest week each month, do you suggest stopping completely from climbing activity or just deload? Yeah, one or the other, for sure. Um, again, uh, you go through this long training cycle. Um, I think, you know, if you're doing an eight or 10 week training cycle, as I've depicted here, you, you probably, if you're training appropriately, you know, not seven days a week, but three or four days a week, you probably don't need a deload week through this eight or 10 week period. And then this last week or week and a half is your taper, is your deload. Now, if you're on a longer training block, for instance, what I have just been on, and probably you have been on where we had this long stay at home order, um, I was taking a deload week every four or five weeks, you know, cause I was training, I was doing two a day training. I was training really hard with my sons you know, we've been out in a long time and our, you know, body needs a lot of training to respond additionally. If you're new to climbing, obviously you wouldn't do as much. But in any case, um, every, you know, month or two, you do need to dial things back. And a deload week would be where you just reduce your volume by two thirds, let's say. Do the same workout, but reduce it by two thirds. Or if you're starting to feel achy, you know, kind of those early tendon uh, joint pains, then maybe a full week off would be in order. Um, and uh, you don't lose much. In fact, a lot of people come back from the deload week or the week off. And if you do some strength testing, you you hit new PRs, you know, because you, you've been overtrained or um, I, I guess some coaches call it, it, it's a functional overtrain in that it's, it wasn't so overtrained that you got sick and ill and injured, but it was overtrained enough that you were not fully recovering from your training. Um, and hence, not until you took the deload week or the week off 
could your body catch up um, and actually for you to realize what 100% is? A lot of climbers don't know what 100% feels like because they never take more than a day or two off um, and they're training so hard uh, that um, they think after two days they're fully recovered. They're not. Um, and that's, again, the beauty of a taper. If you do it right, you will discover uh, hopefully a, a new high level of strength that you've not seen before. Okay. Steven says he needs to get back to climbing. Yeah, brother, me too. Um, okay. Uh, could you do the 753 protocol, but with the campus board? Yeah, you could do something like that. Um, and I, I, I think I outline a, a, a protocol like that in my uh, training for climbing book, third edition. Um, the seventh, 53 protocol is a maximum strength protocol for hangboard that I developed where you do seven second max hang, 53 second recovery, seven second max hang, 53 second recovery, seven second max hang. And then the 53 second recovery after the third max hang actually extends for three to five minutes. Um, and so that's a really good max strength protocol. It's more of an advanced version of the Ava Lopez, 10 second max hang, but you just do it once and then you rest three minutes. Um, if you did this on a campus board where you did um, a ladder up that maybe would only take four or five seconds, you could then rest for the rest of a minute. So if you do a campus ladder up the board or if you're elite and doing double dinos for say five seconds, you would then rest for 55 seconds. So that one minute interval and then you would go back and do your next five second burst on the campus board. And if you did that three times in a row, uh, that actually trains aerobic power. If you do that type of thing regularly, say two, two days per week, uh, you know, the rate at which your muscles reoxygenate and uh, make uh, creatine phosphate for the um, ATP CP system, the A lactic system to power that next burst on the campus board. Now, um, that's not the most common protocol for a campus board. Typically on a campus board, you will make an intense effort on whatever you're doing, ladders, double dinos, switches, you know, there's a variety of things you can do on a campus board. You would make an intense effort that lasts anywhere from three to 10 seconds, and then you would rest for two or three minutes before you make your next intense effort. That's how most campus boarding should be done extensive resting, very brief bursts, because it's all about high power, high quality training. Um, but so applying the 753 or let's say the 555 protocol to the campus board and doing blocks of that is more of an aerobic power or a form of power endurance training, an elite tactic. So it's not something I would recommend to everyone. Okay, well, I'm at 40 minutes and I think I will wrap things up at this point. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining in. I think uh, this is what, Training Cafe number 18. Uh, this Training Cafe was my Make April Great Again initiative where uh, with the COVID lockdown, uh, just trying to do something new to invest in myself and to share with climbers around the world. Uh, some of my knowledge and uh, the feedback has been terrific. We've had some technical difficulties here or there, but uh, if you enjoy the idea of us communing together over coffee, talking training once or twice per week, keep the feedback coming, keep me motivated to do this. Um, and I'll try to um, see if I can make this something that is sustainable over the long run. I'm someone that has a lot of balls in the air, various jobs, uh, my, my Fizzy Vantage company, all of my training projects, uh, my training for climbing website, uh, my training for climbing podcast, which by the way, the next podcast is going to drop on Monday, June 1st. So uh, if you're not subscribed to the podcast, do so on iTunes and leave a review on iTunes. Again, anything you can do to motivate me um, is good because, you know, I'm an older guy and time is limited. And sometimes I feel like I should be investing my time, uh, elsewhere, but then I get the feedback and, uh, you know, um, the kind reviews and it, it, it shows me I'm on the right track in, uh, sharing all this content with, uh, you 
climbing friends of mine. And so with that, uh, I am heading out of town. As I mentioned, I can't tell you when the next episode will be. There might be a week or two where I don't do an episode. I'll try to do a couple from the road or from somewhere out west uh, on a rest day and uh, give you an update on what I'm up to and answer some questions and maybe dig into some crag topics that uh, have popped up in my head as I'm climbing. Um, so I'll see you hopefully in the next week or two. Till then, friends, be safe, be strong, climb on, first out.